Okay, we'll pick up today's uh, lecture where we uh, left off last time, <clears throat> and that is uh, with using uh, the concept of enthalpy, which we introduced in the last lecture. And um, the main thing we need to know that is, is basically for most cases where pressure remains constant during the reaction, uh, enthalpy is just the same as the heat flow, Q. And uh, the pressure does stay the same in most of the reactions we look at, because first of all, uh, we do most of our reactions in uh, open containers, or that is containers that are not airtight. So if any gases are involved, uh, you know, generated or consumed, they will either come from or go to the atmosphere and the pressure remains the same. Uh, <clears throat> most of the reactions that we do don't generate or use any gases anyway, uh, but even if they do, the pressure doesn't change because we don't try to confine the gases. The only time when um, enthalpy would not be the same as heat flow is in a case of like a bomb calorimeter where you're generating gases and you're confining the gases to a certain volume so that the pressure builds up inside. <clears throat> um, it, very often it, when we're dealing with enthalpy, we like to express the heat released or taken in by a reaction in terms of the amount of energy per say mole or per gram of one of the reactants or one of the products. And to do that, we often write these thermochemical equations which remember is just a, a chemical equation that is balanced in order to use or produce one mole of the substance of interest. And sometimes that requires fractional coefficients and fractional coefficients are allowed in thermochemical equations. <clears throat> um, the first example for today that we haven't already done would be uh, one like this. Uh, when 1.42 grams of iron reacts with 1.80 grams of chlorine gas, Cl2, 3.22 grams of FeCl2 solid and 8.60 kilojoules of heat are produced. So this is an exothermic reaction. Remember I said for exothermic reactions, essentially the heat is one of the products because the products are given off by the reaction, but the heat is given off by the reaction too. So this much of the iron chloride and this much heat are both produced by the reaction. So the question is, what is the enthalpy change if one mole of iron chloride is produced? <clears throat> and <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. In other words, what is the enthalpy change per mole of iron chloride produced? In a case like this, you could set up ratios and try to do it like that, and that would work. But the easiest way is just to take the amount of heat that was actually produced for the amount of iron chloride that was produced and divide the heat by the number of moles of iron chloride. Because if they want to know how much heat is produced by one mole, well, that's basically what you get when you get the amount of uh, heat divided by the number of moles. So the number of moles of FeCl2 produced would be uh, the 3.22 grams mass of FeCl2 <clears throat> divided by the molar mass of FeCl2, which is 126.8 grams. And you'll notice in the um, units, grams of FeCl2 cancel. We end up with moles of FeCl2 as the unit, and it's 0 0.02539 grams, or I mean, sorry, moles of FeCl2. Delta H in terms of kilojoules per mole then will then, will then be the heat evolved, which um, if we're going to calculate delta H, then we would want to make the heat evolved negative because again, the, everything is measured from the point of view of the system, which is just the reactant molecules. So if the reaction, if the reaction gives off heat, then that means that the reactants are losing heat. So um, Q would be negative, and therefore delta H would be negative, and you divide that by the number of moles. And we end up with negative 339 kilojoules per mole of FeCl2, uh, I think the book actually uh, reports this number as a positive number because the question is actually what enthalpy, oh, it says what is the enthalpy change? If it says, you know, how much heat is produced, then you could report it as a positive number because produced is just another way of saying negative. So that negative sign right there means the heat is produced by this reaction. It's, I think, 
better to stay on the safe side. And if the heat is being produced, then report all the numbers as negative. Delta H and Q should both be negative if the heat's being produced. And that way you won't get tripped up by the wording of the problem. Uh, enthalpy uh, values are actually characteristic of a given reaction under given reaction conditions. And so as long as you specify the reaction conditions, you should always find the same enthalpy value for a given reaction, uh, you know, it, at least in terms of per gram or per mole of a reactant or a product. Like in this case, this reaction should always produce 339 kilojoules of energy for each mole of iron chloride produced. No matter how much or how little of the iron chloride produced, each mole that is produced should also be accompanied by this much heat. And because of that fact, uh, there are tables that uh, contain enthalpy values for various reactions, uh, in usually in terms of kilojoules per mole. And um, they, but they do have to be listed under specific conditions. And because the conditions can change the value for enthalpy that you get for a reaction, uh, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry has come up with a set of standard conditions, known as standard state conditions, for uh, you know for um, tabulating these values for delta H. And so the standard conditions would be one atmosphere pressure. Uh, what, um, we haven't really discussed pressure yet, but pressure is just a certain amount of force per unit of area. So like pounds of force per square inch of area. Um, that's the kind of pressure or the, the unit for pressure that they use uh, when you inflate tires, pounds per square inch. And pressure is just caused by the fact that gas particles are always in constant motion at very high speeds in random directions. So these little gas particles are always moving around, meaning that they are always striking surfaces. So any given surface is being hit by gas particles all the time. And so if you specify an area of um, surface, you can use the total pressure being exerted on that, say, square inch of surface at any given moment as a measure for the, for the pressure uh, in the air or in you know, the atmosphere. <clears throat> One atmosphere of pressure is equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch. So that would mean, um, and, and one atmosphere is also defined as the average atmospheric pressure at sea level. Okay, so averaged over you know, 365 days a year, if you're at sea level, uh, what, what is the uh, atmospheric pressure likely to be? And that would be one atmosphere. And it's equivalent to 14.7 pounds per square inch. That means that at sea level on an average day, you would have uh, each square inch of anything that's exposed to the air would have a force of 14.7 pounds exerted on it because of all those little gas particles striking it. Uh, so that's sort of a quick introduction to what pressure is and what the units mean. So anyway, one atmosphere would be considered the standard pressure. If you deviate from that um, pressure, like if it's a really stormy day and the pressure is below one atmosphere, then you're going to deviate from the standard value for the enthalpy for the, whatever reaction you're doing. Uh, it doesn't generally deviate a lot unless the pressure deviates a lot from one atmosphere, but it will make a difference. So if you're doing really extremely accurate measurements, then you're going to have to account for the pressure difference. Uh, also, it assumes that all solution concentrations are exactly one molar. So again, if you use different concentrations, you could get a different value for delta H. The temperature is not really specified under the IUPAC rules, but um, the most commonly used temperature would be 25 degrees Celsius which is considered room temperature for some reason, even though 25 Celsius is equivalent to more like 77 or 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a pretty warm room. I, I would really think that 20 degrees Celsius would be more like room temperature. But greater minds than mine have decided that 25 degrees is room temperature. And so that's the most common temperature used for measuring enthalpies. Uh, but if you're going to look up a value in a table, you should 
make an effort to find out what temperature those numbers were measured at. And if um, an enthalpy is measured under standard conditions, then you can use a little subscript zero or O if you prefer. It looks like a little degree sign after the symbol. So enthalpy or change in enthalpy for a reaction measured under standard conditions would be written as delta H with a little, what looks like a degree sign after it. And we'll see that uh, fairly often in tables and, and things like that. <clears throat> the um, standard enthalpy of combustion is um, a special type of enthalpy. And in fact, there are several special kinds of enthalpy that really are just um, you know, specific to the type of reaction that is concerned. So when we say standard enthalpy of combustion, that just means the enthalpy under standard conditions of uh, a combustion reaction involving one mole of whatever is being burned. Okay, so that's standard enthalpy of combustion. So it's really just a normal everyday enthalpy, but it's enthalpy for a certain reaction. So for example, the enthalpy of combustion for ethanol, which has a formula C2H5OH, would be just the delta H under standard conditions for the reaction where you burn one mole of ethanol in oxygen from the air. And when we balance it all out, uh, one mole of ethanol requires three moles of oxygen from the air, and you will get two moles of carbon dioxide and three moles of H2O. That's just the way everything balances out when you have one mole of ethanol. And the delta H for that reaction is negative. I'm not sure if I'm making this better or worse. Negative, <clears throat> negative 1,366.8 kilojoules. Uh, notice it doesn't specify per mole. Although you could, because this is negative, you know, this is 1,366.8 kilojoules emitted for one mole of ethanol. So actually the um, standard enthalpy of combustion for ethanol is 1,366.8 kilojoules for this reaction, but you can also think of that as kilojoules per mole because the reaction is written for one mole. If you did this reaction with a number of moles that's not one, say 0.15 moles, then the amount of enthalpy or energy you should get out of the reaction would be 0.15 times negative 1366.8, because uh, the enthalpy is proportional to the amount of reactants and products. Okay, uh, and the symbol for standard heat of or uh, standard enthalpy of combustion, enthalpies are often also referred to as heat, which is where the symbol H comes from in the first place. So I will often slip and call it heat, but the standard enthalpy of combustion has a symbol delta H degree with a little C as a subscript after it, and so for ethanol it's negative uh, thirteen sixty six point eight kilojoules per mole. And there's a table on page um, 260 or 270, uh, 260 for the hard copy, 270 for the PDF that um, shows enthalpies of combustions for various substances. Practical application of that concept uh, might be something like uh, how much energy or heat is produced by combustion of 125 grams of acetylene. Acetylene has the formula C2H2 and the equation, although, uh, let's see, well, you can look up the equation for the combustion of acetylene, and, or you can actually just, for that matter, look up the, the value for the standard enthalpy of combustion for acetylene, which is negative 1301.1 kilojoules per mole. And then you take your 1.2 or 125 grams of acetylene, divide it by the molar mass, which is 26, to find out how many moles of acetylene you have. And then you multiply it by the kilojoules per mole. And in this case, we end up with uh, negative 6,260 
kilojoules or negative 6.26 times 10 to the third kilojoules. And, or you could actually say negative um, 6.26 times 10 to the third kilojoules is the same as saying 6.26 times 10 to the third kilojoules of heat is produced. So it means the, you know, it means the same thing. The, rea the reaction that this um, uh, enthalpy of combustion corresponds to is the combustion of one mole of acetylene in the presence of oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water liquid. And um, when you balance it out using only one mole of acetylene, you end up with needing five halves oxygen and you get two CO2s and one H2O. And that is all balanced. And again, you can use the fraction because for thermochemical equations, you need to have one mole of whatever is being combusted. <clears throat> Another special type of um, enthalpy is the standard enthalpy of formation, which is written as delta H little degree sign F. And standard enthalpy of formation is just the enthalpy for a reaction where you synthesize a compound from its elements in their lowest energy natural form. Okay, so it's going to be, and it has to be their lowest energy natural form. So if it's something that's normally found as a solid at room temperature and normal atmospheric pressure, then you would have to use, you know, then you would have to use the solid form as your starting material. If it's something that's normally found as a gas at room temperature and normal pressure, then you would have to use the gaseous form of that element. There is uh, one interesting case where carbon actually comes in two different solid forms. And those are known as allotropes. And uh, one form is diamond and the other is graphite. And both of those forms uh, occur naturally, but they don't have the same level of energy content. Uh, it turns out that graphite has a little less energy stored up in its bonds than diamond does. And so whenever you encounter carbon in the case of an enthalpy of formation type situation, you always want to be sure to use the number for carbon in the form of graphite rather than diamond. And both of those will be listed separately in the tables. Carbon solid graphite and carbon solid diamond. And you can use, uh, and, and in fact, this is an interesting point, the fact that graphite is lower in energy than diamond, combined with the fact that nature prefers things to have lower energy, means that most any process that goes from a higher energy situation to a lower energy situation will happen spontaneously. It'll happen on its own. You don't have to do anything to get it to happen. <clears throat> Well, since diamond is a higher energy form of carbon than graphite is, that means that diamond spontaneously converts into graphite. Okay, so diamonds really technically aren't forever, although it this just the fact that this reaction converting diamonds to graphite, the fact that it's uh, spontaneous and it's happening all the time and we can do nothing to stop it, that doesn't mean it's fast, fortunately. So diamonds do convert uh, spontaneously to graphite, but it takes a few billion years for it to happen. So I guess in the span of a human lifetime, diamonds are forever, but not literally forever. Um, okay, so we can use heats of formation. The, the um, real advantage to these uh, standard enthalpies of formation is that you can use those to at least estimate the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction if you don't want to measure it. And measuring it can be a real pain. So why would you want to measure it if you can just look at the tables and find out at least a reasonably uh, accurate measure of, of what it is just by using heats of formation? And all you have to do really is total up the, the enthalpies of formation for all of the products. And from that, subtract the enthalpies of formation for all of the reactants. So it's products minus reactants. And you get the um, enthalpy change for the overall reaction. Okay, so um, the enthalpy of formation under standard conditions for CO2 is negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. 
And that just means that that is the standard enthalpy for the reaction where you um, create one mole of carbon dioxide from its elements in their normal states at room temperature and normal pressure. So you start out with carbon solid as graphite and oxygen gas, and they combine to produce one mole of CO2 gas under standard conditions. The delta H for that reaction is the standard enthalpy of formation for CO2. The heat of formation for NO2 is um, positive 33.2 kilojoules per mole. That just means that that is the standard enthalpy for the reaction where you form one mole of NO2 gas from the elements that make it up in their normal states at room temperature and room pressure. So that would mean one half mole of N2 gas, because remember nitrogen is diatomic, so it only comes in pairs in nature. Uh, so that would be one half mole of N2 gas and one mole of O2 gas yields one mole of NO2 gas. There is a, tander, a table of standard enthalpies of formation in Appendix G at the end of the book. And I'm not, actually, I haven't looked at it yet. I'm not sure if it lists elements or not. Heat of formation values for elements in their lowest energy natural state is are zero. And that's true for all of the elements. And so some tables actually don't list the elements in their lowest energy natural forms because they're all zero. So if you can't find an element in its normal everyday natural state, you can just assume that the number for uh, enthalpy formation is zero. So the heat of formation for carbon in the form of graphite would be zero kilojoules per mole because it already exists in nature. The uh, standard enthalpy of formation for carbon in the form of diamond, though, is um, a little bit bigger than this. It's not zero. It's, it's pretty small but it's not zero. OK, so an example of uh, doing something like this um, might be hydrogen gas reacts explosively with um, gaseous chlorine to form hydrogen chloride gas. So what would be the enthalpy of reaction of one mole of H2 with one mole of Cl2 under the standard conditions? All right, now notice that they specified Oh, and they give you the uh, heat of formation for hydrogen chloride gas as minus 92.3 kilojoules per mole. Well, one catch is you have to notice what they actually told you. You're reacting one mole of hydrogen gas and one mole of chlorine gas, but they didn't tell you how many moles of HCl gas you get as a product. So in this case, you need to know what the reaction is before you can actually figure out the answer to the question. So forming HCl from its elements, if you specify in this case that you have one mole of hydrogen and one mole of chlorine, means that one H2 and one Cl2 will form two moles of HCl. <clears throat> the heats of formation listed in the tables are all in units of kilojoules for one mole. So that means that you're going to have to take the number of moles times the standard heat of formation. So that's two moles of HCl times negative 92.3 kilojoules per mole of HCl. And that's negative 185 kilojoules, or in other words, 185 kilojoules given off. OK, so watch out for the number of moles, um, because this, the standard heats of formation are kilojoules per mole, but you may not have a reaction in which you are actually producing one mole. And um, another example wants you to write the equations corresponding to the standard enthalpy of formation for various compounds. Uh, one of them is C2H5OC2H5, uh, which is diethyl ether. And um, really, all you, you don't really need to know that. All you really need to know is what elements make it up. Well, you've got uh, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, and one mole of, of diethyl ether contains a total of four moles of carbon, the C2 and C2. So that's four moles of carbon in the form of graphite. Plus, you've got um, 10 moles of hydrogen atoms 
But remember, hydrogen in nature only comes in pairs because it's a diatomic gas. So if you want 10 atoms, you would want five H2s. All right, so that's five moles of H2 um, molecules. And there is one oxygen per molecule or one mole of oxygen atoms required for one mole of the product. And that would be equivalent to one half mole of O2 molecules, because again, oxygen is also a diatomic gas and only comes in pairs. So 4C plus 5H2 plus one half O2 would give you just the right number of atoms to form one C2H5 OC2H5. If it's sodium carbonate, Na2CO3, then you're going to want, um, for one mole of that, you're going to want two moles of sodium solid metal and one mole of carbon in the form of graphite. And it's going to be three halves moles of O2 because you need three oxygen, you know, basically three moles of oxygen atoms, but again, oxygen only comes in pairs. So that has to come in the form of O2s. And to get three out of O2s, you need three halves times O2. Three halves times two would be three. And that would give you just the right number of atoms to have Na2CO3. All right. Having gone that far, uh, we can bring that brings us to Hess's law, which is a very useful thing that involves um, values for enthalpies. And uh, the idea behind Hess's law is essentially that um, you don't even necessarily have to get the enthalpy of um, reaction for the reaction that you're actually interested in. If you can get enthalpies of reactions for a bunch of other reactions and manipulate them so that the they algebraically add up to the reaction you're interested in, then you can do the same thing to their delta H's and add them up and get them to add up to the delta H for the reaction you're interested in. And we'll see that in detail in the next segment, but we're a little over time now, so I think I'll stop there for now.